If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me this morning to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And I want to share with you for just a few minutes about a prescription for peace. A prescription for peace. Philippians chapter 4. Uh, while you're turning there, I just want to say I'm so glad you're here today. Uh, you're the only ones not away this week on vacation. Uh, everybody's out. I, I have to tell you the truth. For about the, the first 10 years that I was the pastor of this church, uh, every summer I wanted to like kind of jump off a cliff. Uh, uh, and, and after 10 years, I finally settled down and I said, okay, after Labor Day, they'll all be back again. So, but I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're here this morning. We have some really exciting things that we are planning for the fall and um, we're remember the Lord gave me a word a, a, a little while ago keep doing what you know how to do but I'm going to show you a new way to do it and so uh, all, all over these summer months um, the Lord's been showing us a new way to do some of what we do and as soon as everybody gets back in the fold um, we're going to share about that with you and, and we're super super excited so um, just, just keep your eyes peeled for, um, for some announcements about some new things we have coming. Philippians chapter 4. Let's talk about a prescription for peace. A prescription for peace. Philippians 4. Going to start reading in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, to help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Look at the words of Philippians 4 verse 4, some of the most famous words in scriptures. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and look what the Bible says, and the peace of God will be with you. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Father, thanks for this morning. Thanks for your presence here. Thanks for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that you'd cause each of us to hear a living word from heaven today. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. The Bible is a book of descriptions and prescriptions. The Bible describes God, who he is, what he's like what he has done, what he will yet do. The Bible describes the creation of mankind in the image of God and mankind's rebellion against God resulting in a broken relationship between God and people. And the Bible prescribes the remedy for that broken relationship through repentance, through faith, in the sacrifice of God's only son, Jesus, on the cross. The Bible describes a myriad of blessings that belong to those who love God and who live by faith in Jesus Christ. And then the Bible prescribes how we can obtain those blessings. One of the blessings available for believers that I want to talk about this morning is an otherworldly, supernatural peace. Looking at Paul's words here in Philippians 4, I, I find a prescription for peace 
And I want to share about it with you quickly today. On your way in, you might have received an outline at the door. And if you like, you can watch the screens, listen, and follow along, and fill in the blanks, and, and just stay with us that way. Let's talk about a prescription for peace. First of all, let's talk about a description of God's peace. If there is anything that the world needs today, it's peace. If there's anything, listen, if there's anything that our, our nation needs right now, it's peace. You might have heard this last week in Times Square, there was a motorcycle that backfired because of the, the shootings that have happened in, in the other states around the country. It just set off a, a mass panic and hundreds of people started running in fear for their lives. We had a sister who was down in Broadway and there was some kind of medical emergency that happened in the front of the theater but the people in the theater misunderstood and they thought there was a shooter and so people were running for the exits in, in panic and, and down on the floor lying face down between seats. How many of you know we need peace right now? And, and personally people need peace. On World Health Day, the World Health Organization released a study on the rising prevalence of anxiety and depression. According to the World Health Organization, one in four people around the world suffer from anxiety and or depression. A NBC News recently reported that one in six Americans take some form of antidepressant that's 64 million Americans and those medications by the way account for one-third of the annual deaths from overdose of prescription medications do you know that the last three mass shootings that were in the headlines all three of the shooters were on psychotropic drugs of uh, the the last 17 um, headline making mass shootings uh, 16 of the shooters were fatherless in fact the world health organization forecasts that within the coming decade anxiety and depression will become the number one threat to global public health can you imagine that the world needs peace the world needs peace that isn't easily shattered by changing circumstances our great need is abiding peace peace that remains do you know that peace that remains is precisely what jesus possessed and what jesus promised to give all those who follow him jesus said to us my peace i leave with you I don't give peace like the world gives. My peace remains with you. You see, the peace that the world knows is contingent upon peaceful circumstances. It's contingent upon being free from threat or need or being free from discomfort. But God's peace is peace that defies reason. God's peace is peace when there ought to be panic. God's peace is peace when we're under intense pressure. It's peace when we're in peril. It's peace when we're in pain. It's peace when someone is persecuting us. That's the whole context of the letter of Philippians. Paul is writing, don't be anxious about anything precisely at a moment when he was in prison on capital charges and he had a good reason to be anxious about everything. So what is this my peace that Jesus spoke of in John 14? What is this peace of God in Philippians 4? Let, let's describe it quickly and then I want to talk about how we can get it. What is this peace? Well, first of all, the peace of God means covenant completeness. The peace of God means covenant completeness. Paul was a Jewish scholar. And so Paul's notion of peace was rooted in the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom means the wholeness that comes 
from being in a relationship with God. You see, without God, we're all incomplete. We were created in the beginning for constant fellowship with God. We were created to derive our sense of identity, our sense of self-worth, our sense of security and purpose from being in relationship with Him. Have you ever seen a little duckling that is separated from its mother? It panics and it peeps and it spins around in circles until it's, it's reunited with its mother again. And that's just precisely how we are without God. We panic and we peep and we pirouette. We walk in circles through life without Him. Shalom means that my relationship with Him makes me complete. Shalom means that there is nothing missing and there is nothing broken inside of me because I belong to Him. What is the peace of God? The peace of God is inner calm. There's a settled quietness in my spirit. I'm not easily agitated. I'm not easily instigated or manipulated by others to be afraid or to panic or to be angry. By the way, that, that's precisely how the enemy of our soul operates. He, he tries to get us to take the bait and get agitated, get angry, get irritated. But, but Jesus had this inner calm about him. That's how Jesus slept in the middle of a fierce storm. That's how Jesus kept on loving even when he was betrayed by his closest friends. That's how Jesus held his peace when false accusations were hurled against him. The peace of God is inner calm. The peace of God is inner confidence. Jesus was perfectly whole in his inner person. Jesus was completely secure in his Father's love. He was able to love himself in a healthy way, and he was able to love others freely. Jesus was not threatened. He was not withdrawn. He was not hostile. He was not attention-seeking. Jesus was secure in his family relationships, in his friendships. He was interdependent in a healthy way, not codependent. He was secure in his earthly masculinity. He was secure in his heavenly identity throughout his earthly ministry. Jesus didn't have to grasp that equality with God. He was secure enough to lay aside his divine dignity in order to become a servant. You know, precisely because Jesus was secure, he was able to wrap a towel around his waist and wash the disciples' feet, a job that they wouldn't stoop to do. What is the peace of God? It's, it's inner calm, it's inner confidence. The peace of God is inner courage. David describes this courage in Psalm 112. He says, surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their enemies. The writer of Hebrews describes this inner courage in Hebrews 13. God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I sake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not live in fear. What can mere men do to me? Jesus lived with that kind of inner courage. Jesus stood before Pilate and he said with complete confidence, you have no authority over me except for what my father permits. Jesus was convinced that, that absolutely nothing could happen to him outside of his father's loving permission. And beloved, I want to tell you that you and I can live in that kind of peace too. We can live in that peace that absolutely nothing, absolutely no one can touch a single hair on our head outside of our Father's permission. And if God does permit it, He has a good purpose for it. My peace, the peace of God, what is it we're talking about? We're talking about 
covenant completeness, shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, inner calm, inner confidence, inner courage. I'm safe. I'm secure. I'm valuable. I'm valued by God. I value others all because I'm in a relationship with him. That's a pretty good description of God's peace right there. Maybe second service will we'll, we'll eat that up. So that, that's a good description right there. That's a description of God's peace. Now let's talk about a prescription for getting God's peace. How, how do we get this peace, my peace, the peace of God? How do we get it? Paul gives in Philippians 4 a series of imperatives, a series of commands, prescriptions. The word prescription means do this, take this, follow this. And all of, of these imperatives, all of these commands, if we will do them, that they lead to obtaining and hanging on to God's peace. So let's look at them. How do we get God's peace? First of all, hide your life in Christ. Hide your life in Christ. <clears throat> Once again, in Philippians, we come across these words, joy and rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. You know, this, this little letter of Philippians uses the words joy and rejoice more than any other book in the New Testament. There's a progression in the letter of Philippians. In chapter one, Paul says, I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. In chapter two, he says, I rejoice with you, now you rejoice with me. In chapter three, he says, rejoice in the Lord, it's a safeguard for you. So here's the progression, I rejoice, we rejoice together, now you rejoice in the Lord as you have seen me do. And then in chapter 4 he says, and again I say, rejoice all over again. But I, but I want to tell you, this is more than just putting on a happy face. It's more than just adopting a positive mental attitude. This is rejoicing in the Lord. It, it means that I have an inner celebration of him. I have an inner celebration of his character. I have an inner celebration of his mighty deeds. I have an inner celebration of his promises. I have an inner celebration that is sparked by his presence with me. And listen, that gives us lasting peace. Circumstances constantly change. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Listen, listen, listen. I want you to receive this. I want you to receive this because it'll, it'll help you so much. If the only thing I celebrate in life is good circumstances, my celebrations will be short-lived indeed. How many of you know that good circumstances come and they go? He gives and he takes away. Blessed be his name. Good times come and good times go, and thank God good times come back again. But if that's all I celebrate, I'm going to be constantly riding a roller coaster. But if I celebrate Him, I always have a reason to celebrate. People constantly come in and out of our lives. I tell my kids all the time, I've told them ever since they were little, I used to drive them to school every morning, and I, I love that half hour in the car with them every morning, and, and one thing I always told my kids is we never know how long someone will be in our life, so we have to enjoy them all we can while we have. People constantly come and go out of our lives, but Jesus has promised, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the age, to the ends of the world, and his presence with me is a source of constant joy. I heard on the news yesterday that the National Hurricane Service has predicted that the end of this hurricane season 
is going to become a lot more active than normal. I guess there's, I don't know, there was some La Nina, El Nino, El something out there, and, and, and it's just changed. And so they, they think that the, the hurricane season is going to ratchet up now. But do you know that you don't have to go very far at all under the surface of the ocean to escape a hurricane's fury? When a hurricane is approaching, aircraft carriers, destroyers, frigates, they all have to clear out of the way, but not submarines. All submarines have to do is dive. Can I tell you that the strength of the mightiest waves dissipates very quickly when you go under the surface? The formula is about, follow me, about half the height of the wave underneath the, surf the surface and the energy of that wave is mostly gone. So, in other words, if you have a 20-foot wave, all you have to do is go 10 feet under the surface and 96% of the energy of that wave is dissipated. So 10 feet under the surface, the force of a 20-foot wave is like a 1-foot wave. A 60-foot wave is a killer... But 30 feet under the surface, it has the strength of just a three-foot wave. How many remember way back in 2004 when the Christmas tsunami hit? Killed a quarter of a million people in Sri Lanka and in India. I remember hearing the story of these two Israeli scuba divers, husband and wife, who were off the coast of Thailand diving. And when the tsunami rolled by them under the water, they said that, that they did several somersaults. The, the wife's mask, uh, her, her mouthpiece and her mask, you know, got, got moved around. And so they surfaced to adjust their gear. And they looked at each other and they shrugged and they said, gee, that was weird. Having no idea that just a mile away, that wave took the lives of a quarter of a million people. But under the water, they were safe. Now listen, in Philippians 3, Paul writes, I want to be found in Christ. In Colossians, Paul writes, if we believe in Jesus, our life is hidden in Christ. So listen, this is how it works. Rejoicing in the Lord is like being under the water in a hurricane or in a tsunami. No matter how fierce the storm, no matter how deadly the surge, if we're found in Christ, if we're hidden with him, if our lives are buried with him, then we are barely affected. Oh, we might feel something pass by us, but all the destructive force is dissipated. We are perfectly safe, hidden in him under the waves. That's good preaching right there. Mm. Beloved, can I tell you, that's a reason to get out of bed on Sunday morning and come to church, even on a beautiful summer morning in August. Can I tell you, we're not here out of duty. We're not here out of obligation. We came here to rejoice in the Lord. We came here to celebrate Him. We came here to celebrate His goodness. We came here to celebrate His promises. We came here to celebrate His mighty deeds. We came here because He's here. And I want to tell you, I've and even for those watching online, you're going to have more peace this week because you came and you celebrated Jesus in this place this morning. A prescription for getting peace. Hide your life in Christ. Here's the second one. I like this one. Be agreeable, not stubborn. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. In the Philippian church, there were two women leaders, Yodia and Syntyche. The name Yodia means fragrant. The name Syntyche means, thank you, Jesus. The Lord's just winking at us there. 
The name Syntyche means fortunate. But these two women had the misfortune of getting into some kind of dispute that was stinking up the whole church. There's more preaching than we really have time for this morning, but can I tell you, even leaders in the church, even pastors, welcome Pastor Kevin, I'm glad to see you. Even pastors in the church are are capable of becoming immature and disagreeable. Paul gives these two sisters high commendations. He says they contended at his side. That probably means that they endured persecution alongside Paul when he was founding the Philippian church. They were there since the beginning. He says they were co-workers. That means they had some kind of ministry leadership role. Doesn't matter, can I tell you, how long the tenure, how high the position, no one in the body is immune from developing an offended spirit. And listen, when two influential people are in disagreement with one another, it poses a very serious threat to the body of Christ. I have two questions for you this morning. First of all, are you agreeable or are you stubborn? Paul tells these two sister leaders, Agree with each other in the Lord. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That word gentleness has been translated many different ways. William Tyndale, who translated one of the first English Bibles, translated it as softness, being pliable, be flexible. Some other translations are yielding, forbearing, lenient. It involves yielding your personal rights and showing consideration. Another translation is an attitude of non-retaliation towards your persecutors. Showing an attitude of kindness when the expected response would have been retaliation. I like this as my favorite translation. It's sweet reasonableness. Let your sweet and reasonable spirit be evident to all. You see, when you're offended, you're precisely the opposite of sweet and reasonable. Proverbs 18, verse 19 says, An offended brother, or in the case of the Philippians, two offended sisters, is more stubborn than a fortified city. And disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. When you're offended, your heart and your mind are closed to hear the appeals and the ideas of the person who offended you, or even to hear their apologies. When you're offended, you're unreasonable. You can't be reasoned with, and you can't reason clearly. When you're offended, you're oversensitive and highly defensive. Everything sounds like an attack against you. When you're offended, you're territorial. You perceive everything as a threat against your turf. You're protective of your position and your rights. When you're offended, you're stubborn. You refuse to like anything. You refuse to agree on anything. You refuse to cooperate on anything. When when you're offended, you're passive-aggressive. You might be sitting down on the outside, but you're standing up on the inside. There was a father one day who sat his stubborn little daughter in a timeout chair. After a few minutes, he went over to her to see if she had a change of heart. And with her arms folded and her eyes fixed and her mouth clenched in a pout, she said, Daddy, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. When you're offended, you're combative. Everything is grounds for a fight. When you're offended, you're conspiratorial. You gather your supporters around you. You draw battle lines with the opposing side. That's what was happening in the Philippian church. When you're offended, listen, this is powerful. You're spiritually dangerous because you're a potential open doorway through whom the enemy can come and introduce dissension. When you're offended, you're immature, both in the natural and in the spiritual sense. Paul says, agree in the Lord. 
manifest gentleness because the Lord is near. What did Jesus say about himself? He said, take my yoke and learn from me. For I am, what? Do you know the word of God? I am meek and gentle of heart. Two questions. Are you agreeable? And second, are you agreeable to all or only to those whom you prefer? Paul says, let your gentleness, let your sweet reasonableness, let your agreeableness, let it be known to all. Are you agreeable towards some and argumentative towards others? Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let your gentleness be manifested to all. Let your gentleness be shown to all. Not just to your fan base or your supporters or those you rely on. Manifest uh, agreeableness to those who have insulted you, to who have undervalued you. Manifest sweet reasonableness to those who oppose you. Manifest forbearance to those executing you. Beloved, listen to me. If you want God's peace, you must be a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. What did Jesus say? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. A prescription for getting peace. You with me this morning? Hide your life in Christ. Be agreeable, not argumentative. A third thing for getting peace, be prayerful and not fearful. This is my favorite part right here. Some of the most famous words in the New Testament are in Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. How is it possible to not be anxious about anything? How is it possible to not be anxious when you need a job or a better job? How is it possible not to be anxious when something's wrong with the kids, when they're sick, when they're going down a wrong path? How is it possible not to be anxious when you've received a, a bad report, a bad diagnosis? Here's the tweetable line of the day. The only way not to be anxious about anything is to pray about everything. That was so good, I'm going to say it again. The only way not to be anxious about anything is to pray about everything. Paul says here, in everything, pray. Jesus taught us there's a connection between prayer and fearlessness. Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount three times, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. Do not worry about your life. Do not worry about your physical needs. Do not worry about tomorrow. And then Jesus said, your father already knows what you need before you even ask him. Now, if that's the case, if God already knows before we even pray, why pray at all? Well, it's because in the process of articulating our needs, we're casting all of our cares on him and we're declaring our faith in him. Beloved, can I tell you, I always feel better after I pray. You know, it's so true what the, the hymn writer said, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because... We don't carry everything to God in prayer. I, I always feel so much better. I, I fret and I, I think and I, I, I try to solve problems. And, and after I pray, I feel so much better. After I pray, I have peace. After I pray, I, I can think clearly. I can concentrate. I can problem solve. After I, I pray, I can relax and I can enjoy all the beauty and all the good things around me. God has designed it that he works on earth and he works in our lives in response to our prayers. And he told us so. It's his prescription. So let's follow it. Paul says, pray about everything. Have you ever wondered if there's something too small to pray about? Oh, Lord, you know, you're a busy guy running the universe up there. You have a lot of needs and, 
and a lot bigger things and, and this thing is so small I, 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 I can't really pray about it. It's just too small to bring to you. I want you to think about that for just a minute with me. Really, is there anything that's big to God? Is there anything big to Him? He, he said in His Word, nothing is too hard for me. Nothing is too, nothing we could possibly bring. Even, even the biggest need you can imagine to put before Him is, is a small matter to Him. It's big to Him because it's big to us, but in order to answer it, it's a small thing for the Lord. So, Paul says, pray about everything. There's nothing too small to pray about because it's all small to him. It's big to us, and because it's big to us, it's big to him. But for him to answer, it's just a small thing. So pray about everything. How do we get God's peace? Hide your life in Christ. Be agreeable, not stubborn, and be prayerful, not fearful. And this is what Paul says, and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and mind. Hide your life, be agreeable, pray about everything, and God's peace will encircle your mind like a fortress wall. God's peace will circle your emotions like a fortress wall. God's peace will circle your decision-making like a fortress wall. God's peace will encircle your interactions with other people like a fortress wall. A description of God's peace, a prescription for getting peace, Finally, very quickly, let's talk about a prescription for retaining peace. Well, once we've, we've received the peace of God, I don't know why the lights keep going on and off. It's, I don't know, it's Jesus signaling us. Once we have obtained the blessing of God's peace, how do we maintain it? How do we hold on to his peace? Paul tells us in verses 8 and 9 of Philippians 4, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. I actually, look at the screens and let's read it together. Finally, let's read it together. Finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. Our girls in our Wednesday night girls club memorize these verses. I want to tell you, these are verses that every one of us ought to commit to memory. We ought to print them out. We ought to post them on our television, on our computer screen. We ought to make these the, the background photo on our smartphone. Maybe Philippians 4, 8, and 9 would make a good password for you. Why is there such a sharp increase in anxiety and depression? Why is one in every six Americans on medication? It's because of our lousy diet. And I don't mean fast food, although that contributes. But specifically, I mean it's because of what we are feeding our minds and our emotions and our spirits. So how do we maintain God's peace once we've got it? Very quickly, I'll go through these, we'll be done. Number one, stop eating junk food. Actually, we could flip Paul's words and we could state them negatively so we know what not to do. Whatever is false, whatever is dishonorable, whatever is unjust, whatever is morally impure, whatever is ugly, bloody, gory, dark, evil, whatever is repulsive, if anything is despicable or lacking virtue, listen, do not think on these things. <laughs> How does your favorite television series line up to that list? Game of Thrones, Big Little Lies, The Walking Dead, I don't want to talk about the walking dead. I want to talk about those raised to life in Jesus Christ. How, how do your movie choices line up with that list? How, how does your internet browsing line up with that list? How, how about your reading choices and your music preferences? Listen, beloved, you are what you eat. It is not only true for our physical bodies, 
but it's true for our inner man as well. If you feast on sexually impure junk food, your inner man will become impure. If you feast on violent junk food, your inner man will become angry. If you feast on sarcasm and sardonic humor, your inner man will become cynical. If you feast on horror and gore, your inner man will become anxious and fearful. We had a woman years ago, many, many years ago, we had a woman in our church, very bright, young executive. If I told you the name of her company, you would instantly know it. National company, and she had a very high position, and she came for prayer one day because she was gripped by a terrible spirit of fear. And as we started to pray and unpack things a little bit, we found out that she was a huge fan of those vampire novels that were, were so popular um, a little while back ago, you know, the Anne Rice novels and, and the other things. And, and so here's what we found out. She was sowing darkness in her mind. She was sowing gore in her spirit and to her emotions. And what she reaped from that was a spirit of fear. How do we retain peace? Stop eating junk food. Second, eat clean. Eat clean. Feed your spirit what is true and just and pure and noble and lovely and excellent. Obviously, the best place to start is the word of the Lord. His word is truth. His word is pure. The Bible says in Psalm 119, great peace have those great peace. How many of you would like to have great peace? Peace that remains. Great peace have those who love your law. And I love this. And nothing can make them stumble. But Paul's words don't limit us only to what's Christian. Paul says whatever is true. Whatever is pure. Whatever is noble and lovely. One of the Places that I, I love to find beauty is God's creation. Uh, another place I love to find beauty is in people and celebrating them, what's best about them. In, in my office, I have a shelf right next to my desk and I have it loaded down with pictures of my family and good friends and wonderful times that we've had on vacations and, and ministry trips that we've taken. And every so often I glance over at them and I, I just enjoy thinking about the people in my life and what a wonderful blessing they are and how I've grown to love them and what's good about them. One of the things Denise has done ever since our kids were little is she used to read them stories of real life heroes people who have changed history for the better through their courage, through their determination and innovation. She's read them stories of great missionaries and great people of faith. Can I tell you, those are so much more inspiring than Superman and Batman and Aquaman beating the stuffing out of each other. How do we retain peace? Stop eating junk food, eat clean. Finally, worship team, come rescue me. Keep practicing your faith. Keep practicing your faith. Paul uses one of my favorite words in the closing of these verses. He says, whatever you have learned from me, whatever you've seen me do, he says, you put it into practice. I love that word practice. Practice means I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. Practice means I, I haven't mastered it yet, but I'm growing Practice means God doesn't expect perfection out of me yet, but he's watching my progress and he's pleased. Practice. Practice what you've been taught. Practice what you've seen other successful believers do. Practice. Put it into practice what you've learned from the word. Practice rejoicing. Practice gentleness. Practice agreeableness, sweet reasonableness. Practice prayer and everything. Practice refraining from junk food. Practice eating clean. Practice, practice, practice. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding the inexplicable peace of God when we should be panicking the inner calm the inner confidence the inner courage the peace of God that encircles your emotions and your thinking and your relationships and your decision making like a fortress that peace of God will remain with you God's peace 
a description of it, a prescription for getting it, and a prescription for retaining it. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place today?